light. So if you'd all turn over to Acts chapter 2, that's where we're going to start off this morning. Acts chapter 2. When people uh, become uncomfortable, the normal reaction is to discontinue any pursuit of spiritual truth or to find a wider path. There's a lot of people that will start to get some sort of semblance of spiritual truth and they'll transfer from, well, I'm talking with this person, but I'm going to find a different outlet for my spiritual truth. I'm going to find a different avenue that I can, oh, well, this is easier to, to keep. Or this is, uh, I like this guy's preaching better because it makes me feel good. There's a lot of churches that are all about health and wealth gospel today. They're like, oh, yep, God's going to bless you. You're going to have great health. You're going to be wealthy, uh, you know, and just all these things. I don't recall Christ ever saying that. I don't recall him ever coming through and just, oh, yeah, it's all going to be good. But there's a lot of people that attend churches today that that preacher is not willing to preach the whole truth. You know, the Bible commands a preacher to preach the whole counsel of God. But too many churches are out there and they're like preaching, you know, this this mush God type of a deal where there's like, oh, yeah, preacher, that sounds good. You know, you're making me feel good. Pour the syrup on. You know, it sounds real good. Uh, just keep on going because they don't want to deal with conviction. They don't want to deal with guilt. They don't want to have to hear that. They want to find a wider path for them to try and make their way to God. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 tells us, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They were under conviction. They were like, what am I going to do? There are many times where a preacher will be preaching or maybe somebody's just talking to somebody and they're telling them about the Bible and they're getting that guilty feeling. They're getting that conviction and they're like, oh man. Well, in that moment, they kind of have one of two decisions to make. How am I going to fix this? How am I going to relieve the guilt? Am I going to go and find a wider path? Or am I going to say, all right, well, it says that this is wrong and this is where I need to overcome this. I need to go this way. You kind of have two choices. That, that's the way that you've got to go. Those are the only ways that you're going to relieve that guilty feeling or that conviction. But we see that they felt conviction. So we're going to start in talking about some important spiritual truths. You know, spiritually speaking, when we look at the Bible, if you've ever heard the statement, oh, ignorance is bliss. Well, think about it this way. If you, you know, we're coming up to July 15th, the time where they have now moved the taxes deadline to, and you say, oh, well, you know, I don't know if I do or don't owe, owe the government any, you know, money. It's okay. I'm just going to be ignorant about it. it. You know, I don't need to worry about it. It's just going to be blissful if I just don't know anything about it. No, it's probably not. It's probably not going to end up very good for you. It's probably not going to end up very well. Well, a lot of people are that way spiritually. They look at it and they're just like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't need to know. I'm just, I'm content where I'm at. You start telling them about the gospel. You start telling them about what Christ did for them and, and that there's only one way to heaven. It's not a, you know, a spoked wheel where there, you know, God's at the center and there's all these different ways. There, there's one way. God is the way, the truth, and the light. And it's like, nope, nope, I don't want to hear about it. Spiritually, being ignorant, it's not going to be blissful. Second Peter 3, 5 tells us, For this they willingly are ignorant. Or Hosea 4, 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. There's a lot of people out there that are just like, nope, nope, don't want to hear anything. I've had doors that I've knocked on before where as soon as they hear that I'm like, Hi, my name's Justin. I'm from such and such a church. Nope. Thank you. Close the door. I'm just going to remain ignorant. I'm just blissfully ignorant, and I don't want to hear about any of this. I don't want to have to worry about this. Did you know that there's a lot of people in the world that are hanging on to the first thing that they were taught? That first thing that they thought was spiritual truth? There's people in different denominations all across our nation that I'm content with being, you know, in this. And they're just clinging to that. Well, well, this is the first thing that I was taught. I, you know, it's got to be right. I praise the Lord that the first thing that I was taught was the right thing. So I can look to the first thing and say, you know what? It was truth. I was able to research it out and look through God's word and prove that it was truth. But there's a lot of people that don't. They just cling to that first thing and say, well, you know, I was, you know, I was raised this way. And, and you know, I went through... Um, now I can't remember what it's called. Catechism. Thank you. 
I went through catechism. I was, you know, proved and everything. And now I'm, I'm a member of the church. And I found it really funny when I was in high school, everybody I knew that, that was of that denomination that had gone through and they're like, oh yeah, I was confirmed into the church. And then they never attended again. I thought you were being confirmed to be a part of the church. I'm so confused right now. I, that, that just doesn't make any sense to me. But there's a lot of people that are like, well, no, no, this is the first thing I learned. It's got to be true. And so they cling to it. I'd rather remain ignorant. I'd rather remain out of it. I don't want to, you know, think about it. But think about this. God originally created man to love them. God created man so that he would have somebody to love. You know, God, God's out there in eternity somewhere, totally content by himself. He doesn't need anybody else to exist. He doesn't have to have anything else to exist. He's all-powerful, all-knowing. He's everywhere, all by himself. But he was just full of love. I have this love, and I want to give it to somebody. So he created man. Well, we think, well, God knows everything, so he knew man was going to sin. Can you imagine that love? Knowing these people that I'm going to create, these first people that I'm going to create are going to sin. You know, we could go through and calculate it out and think, oh, Adam lived how many generations ago? And God knew that the first generation was going to sin, the very first people that he created were going to sin. Can you imagine that love? He had all this love and he wanted to do something with it. 1 John 4.19 tells us we love him because he first loved us. You know, a lot of people I've, I've talked to, they're like, oh, well, why would a loving God do this? Or why would a loving God do that? And I've had discussions about free will. And, you know, well, why would God do this? Well, because God, if God created you and forced you to love him, it's not really loving him. It's not. It, it's never going to fall into that category. But if we are given the free and open opportunity to make the choice to love God, Oh man, that's, you know, that's got to be awesome. I, I'll joke with my wife sometimes that my father-in-law, you know, forced me to, to marry her. It, it's a joke, but, you know, she's like, ha ha, funny, funny. But I chose to love her, just like God chose to love us. And within that love, it's like, wow, that's amazing, you know. And then you go back to thinking about, wow, this God who just existed all by himself, and he said, I want somebody to love. So he created us so that he could have somebody to love. What love does, does God have? It, it's just absolutely amazing. But then we think of, well, that first generation did sin. Mankind sinned right away. Jesus said in, in Mark 7, 21 to 23, it says, For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Let's go a little further. Let's add a few things. Selfishness, lying, stubbornness, anger. We have a very angry world that we live in today. There are people that you talk to that are just, you know, you get cut off in traffic and they just, you know, they call it road rage. They just, you know, get terribly angry that somebody cut me off in traffic. We live in an angry world. What about cursing? All over the place. There used to be the statement of, wow, they curse like a sailor. Or, you know, well, now I don't even know how to categorize it. There are, you know, there used to be a time where you would hear a woman curse and be like, oh, I hear women that curse worse than men today. And it's like, this is, you know, wow, that is just crazy to me. It happens. Drunkenness. We're living in a world that the drunks in the world are drowning in alcohol and they think they're having a good time. All these people in the world that are just like consumed with alcohol, are, they're drowning and they have no clue. They're just like, oh yeah, I'm totally fine, I'm content, I'm blissful, and I'm just going to remain ignorant. Man chose to sin. Romans 3, 10 and 23 tells us, There is none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. To God, our righteousness is like a filthy rag. And not only is it like a filthy rag, when the description is given, it's not like, oh, I wiped the counters off and this rag is dirty. 
It is, I'm a leper and I'm using this rag to clean my wounds, dirty rag. Like that is absolutely disgusting. You think about, you know, medical treatments and, and you know, they, they go through medical supplies, cleaning up wounds and things. And that's kind of what I think of when I think of a dirty rag. I'm just like, that's wow. That's just really, really gross. And that's how God views my sin or views my sin views my righteousness what i think is righteousness wow that really puts me in a you know kind of in a pinch well good thing god created a way out of that did you know that we're born spiritually dead when god was in eternity past and he said i have all this love that i want to give i want to love mankind and so he created mankind he said let us make man in our image in our likeness well, you know, somebody who might not know the Bible would think, wow, is God crazy up there? He's talking, you know, in the third person or something, you know, our, our, this, it's just God. Well, yeah, he's having this nice little conversation between God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. And they want to make man in their image. That word is a trichotomy. Did you know man is body, soul, and spirit? Three parts. And when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God said, the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. Did they physically die that day? No, they did not physically die that day, but they died spiritually that day. Because then you'll know when it, when it says that Adam had a son and he named him Seth, it says that he was born in his image. He was born in Adam's image. He was full of sin, but he was only a two-part being. That spiritual side of him was dead. Anybody who was born today, that spiritual side of them is dead. They ate of the tree. They sinned. They died spiritually that day. Now all of us are born in this sinful state. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Every one of us is born in this sinful state. You know, there are people in the room today that have children, and I have children, and I look to it as... I know that those kids are sinners, but what if you think about it this way? I have these kids, and they're just, they're, they're, they're born these perfect little kids. There's nothing wrong. And then they sin for the first time, or I notice the first time that they sin. <gasps> Who broke into my house and taught that child to sin? Who taught that kid to lie? It's just, I can't believe that. Somebody had to have taught them that. Well, no, it's, it's in their nature. Every one of us is that way. You know, we can go through the whole list of the Ten Commandments and, and, and go through and say, well, you know, have you ever lied? Have you ever, you know, stolen something? Have you ever taken too long of a break at work? Well, you just stole the boss's time, uh, you know, and we can just go through the entire list. We're all born this way. But think about this. Psalms 51.5 says, behold, I was shapen in iniquity. Even at conception, we were born in sin because our parents are sinners. Nobody in the world is born without sin. But it says, and in sin did my mother conceive me. We are all sinners from conception. But what about this world that we live in? God created this, this world. God created, you know, the garden with Adam and Eve. And it was this beautiful, wonderful place. The world that we live in today, it, it's a sinful mess. It's, you know, we can especially look at the things that have been going on in the world. That, you know, we think about the media and everything that's going on. And our world is a wreck. Our world is a sinful mess. First John 5, 19 says, the whole world lieth in wickedness. Or if we looked over at John chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Why are bars so darkly lit? Their deeds are evil. They don't want people to, I just want to go sit in this dark place and, and consume my alcohol uh, upon my, you know, sadness or whatever, fill in the blank. Why are all these humongous rock concerts dark? They have the stage lit and everything else is dark and all of the wicked and evil things that take place is... Why? Because man loves darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. There's a reason for all of it. God has told us this centuries ago and it just continually proves itself. We can look at, you know, we talked about, you know, giving credibility to the Bible. We spent two lessons on doing it. That's why we can look to things like this and say, God told us this how long ago, you know, in eternity past, the Bible was hard. God already knew what the Bible was going to be. It's his word. And it just proves itself over and over again. And we just see that, wow, that, that it's 
it's crazy to me to th think about it sometimes. Wow, it's just proved itself true for centuries. Man loves darkness rather than light. We must recognize our sinfulness before we can get saved. Did you know that there kind of is a, a prerequisite for getting saved? Christ said that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, if we don't view ourselves as lost, how do we access that gift? If we don't see that we're sinners, if we don't see that, man, there's no way that I'm ever going to be able to keep God's law. There's no way that I'm ever going to be able to work my way to heaven. I can't earn my salvation. Christ said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. The world, it, it, it's a lost place. Did you know that most people in this world are going to hell? We don't hear a lot of preaching like that. I'm not saying pastor doesn't do that. I'm saying worldwide. We don't hear a lot of preaching like that. There's a lot of people that are continually preaching that health and wealth gospel. They're not preaching things and talking about hell. You know, I still, I, I remember hearing sometimes, you know, you would see somebody mention the word hell and not in a, you know, slanderous way or, or using it as a swear word. And people are like, oh, no, 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 I don't believe in that. Well, do you believe in God? Well, yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's God, but there's no way hell's real. You know, it's, it's not a real place. You know, again, previous statement, why would a loving God? Well, he has a reason for it. Matthew seven twenty two to 23 says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I prophesy unto them, I never knew you depart from me ye that work iniquity. You know, the saddest thing about that entire verse, or those two verses, the, the whole thing, it doesn't sound like a lost person. Did we not prophesy in thy name? We did many wonderful works. And man, that sounds an awful lot like people who claim to be Christians. It sounds an awful lot like some people who are preachers throughout the world. That's a sad statement to read. That's a sad thought to have. What about, again, Matthew chapter 7, but verses 13 and 14. It says, Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. I feel like, I feel very saddened sometimes to think about heaven, and think, man, it just, it has the potential to be so full. God has extended this gift so openly, yet so many have chosen this wide path, this, oh, it's easier for me to, you know, worship God this way. And we look back to those verses, you know, many are going to be in that day. Well, Lord, Lord, have we not, did I not do this? Did I not give to your church? Did I not do this? There's, there's a big difference between, you know, I'm saved and on my way to heaven and I'm walking this wide path. Many people in this world who claim to be Christians, well, I go on Sunday mornings, you know. Well, yeah, but what were you doing last night? What were you out doing last night? God knows our hearts. He knows what's going on. Think about it this way. You know, in Matthew 12, 40, it, it tells us that, uh, you know, a day and a night Jonas spent in the whale's belly. And I'm not quoting this directly, but... Then it says that Christ is going, or sorry, I quoted it incorrectly already. Three days Jonah spent in the whale's belly, and it says, you know, three days and three nights, will, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. What's that referring to? Well, it's talking about Abraham's bosom. You know, it's talking about that, the, this place where, you know, people weren't able to get into heaven yet. So God had created this place for him. But do you remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Lazarus? What, what took place? Were they able to see each other? They were able to see each other from where they were. You know, it says there was this great gulf that divided it. It says it's in the heart of the earth. I want to show you a verse. Turn over to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. And verse 14, God's word tells us, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. Did you know today, as of June 2020, 
There are 44 active volcanoes across the world. They're constantly, you know, within, I think the parameter was given, if it has some sort of an eruption within a three-month period of time, it's still considered an active volcano. Where does all that lava come from? Well, scientifically, it says that it comes from down deep in the earth. Do you think hell's expanding itself to make room for all these people that are turning their back on God? All these people that are saying, you know what, I'm, I'm content in being blissfully ignorant, spiritually ignorant. I'm content with that. Well, you know, I, you can't prove that, Justin. Well, no, I probably can't. I don't know enough about science to try and prove all of that. But I know enough about God's word to say that, well, God's word's true. And if hell continually is expanding itself to make room for all these people, that's just more people that aren't going to heaven. And that's a sad thought. That's a hard thought to think about. You know, people go throughout this world and they just say, oh, everything's okay. It's going to be all right. You know, just pick yourself up by your bootstraps. It's going to be okay. I hate to break it to you, but everything is not okay in the world that we live in. Ephesians 5, 6 tells us, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You know, I read a thing on Facebook recently that was talking about um, everything that was going on with COVID and, and, you know, people who are in the world that, well, you want to put God before me, or you want to put sports before God? Okay, we're going to take those away. You want to put restaurants before God? Okay, we're going to take those away. You want to make an excuse for not being able to go to church? Okay, well, now you can't go to church. You want to, you know, and it's just this list of, and that was just a couple of the things that were on the list. But to look at everything that's going on in the world and say that God's not doing something is spiritually ignorant. You know, God is at work. God is doing things. God is trying to gather attention of the people of this world. And there's so many people that are, it's, it's okay. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to worry about that or I'll worry about that later in life. I want to do my own thing right now. You know, teenagers, when we were at camp, Brother Gallus talked about, you know, being, doing my own thing, and I'm just going to be this rebel over here, and I'm doing my own thing, but I'm just like these, you know, 30 other kids that are standing there. They're all doing their own thing, except we all look alike. I'm just going to do my own thing. Why don't you try doing your own thing and follow God? Because I guarantee you there's not a whole lot of people doing it today. You want to be an individual? You want to be, you know, stand out? guarantee you, you're going to stand out real quick. You start doing exactly what God tells you to do in his word, you're going to stand out like a sore thumb in this world. You know, we, we live in this dark place. What's a little bit of light do in a very dark place? Last night, we were having the, the, the fireworks were out here, and, and we had a bunch of teenagers out here and some church members that were out there, and some people got out some of the glow sticks. Well, it had been dark for a little while, and, you know, my son ended up with a little glow stick, and you know, he walks over to me, dad, 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 dad. And I was like, wow, okay, that was actually kind of bright. Well, my eyes were used to the darkness. What's a little bit of light doing a world full of darkness? This world is a dark place. This world is not okay. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10 tells us, The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. That's a pretty big list. And it says none of these people are going to be able to inherit the kingdom of God. God loves mankind, but his justice will not be overlooked. God has a law. It will come to pass. Thankfully, God has provided a way out but so many people don't want to look at that. They don't want to hear this way out. They don't want to hear about this opportunity. Um, other than that, we have all these people that are in the world that I'm just going to follow my own heart. I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm just going to, you know, we, we think about Jiminy Cricket. You know, let your conscience be your guide. And everybody lives that way. Um, you know, I'm just going to be true to me and I'm going to, you know, live, you know, by my heart and do, you know, what... What feels good? Well, what does Jeremiah 17, 9 tell us? Anybody? Our heart? It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
But I loved the day when I found out, minor side note, looking at that verse and thinking, wow, our heart is so, it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? But then we look at Psalms and we see that it says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God can know our heart. But nobody wants to let God know. Nobody wants to let God in. Even though God is this all-knowing, all-powerful, he's everywhere, he sees everything that's going on, there's nothing that we can hide from God. When we're approached with a time where, you know, God's kind of poking at our heart a little bit. No, 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 God, I can't let you in. He knows what's going on already. Why do we push him out? Why do we block him? Why do we prevent him? Our hearts are desperately wicked. We don't want to let God in. We don't want to let God in to this. You know, Exodus chapter 20 goes through and it gives the Ten Commandments. Did you know the second commandment? You know, I, I kind of view that commandment as uh, the human race's darling sin. We're not supposed to have any God, you know, uh, of our own imagination. Have you ever heard the statement made? Well, to me, you know, God is like this. To me, you know, I think God is, you know, more like this. It doesn't matter what you think about God. It matters what God says about God. Everybody's, oh, no, well, God wouldn't do that. God wouldn't send a person to hell if he really loves them. Yes, he will. And you will find out one day when you stand before him. I find it very interesting going through the book of Revelation and seeing everything that takes place, you know, all the judgments that take place. And there is a verse that says that God will wipe away every tear. But did you know that it takes place after the judgment? Did you know that we're going to have to stand there someday and hear about person after person? Depart from me, I never knew you. I really hate to say it, but that list is going to be really long. That's going to be really hard to stand there. What if there's somebody standing up there that can see everybody in the crowd and, hey, you, so-and-so, why didn't you tell me about this? Why didn't you tell me that there was a way that I didn't have to endure this? Why, was there, why didn't you do that? And it, it does come down to their, their own fault. But... Are we not still supposed to be out there telling others? Are we still not supposed to be out there? The Bible says, go and tell. We are supposed to be out there telling other people. But people are just going to, you know, follow their own hearts. They're going to make this God of their own imagination thinking, God wouldn't really do that. God's not really going to send me to hell. It's okay. I'm just going to, you know, cling to my own heart and my own thoughts and and follow my way. And it's going to be okay. It's all going to work out in the end. It will all work out in the end the way that God has deemed that it is going to. And he says that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. We are going to be judged for our lives. So we look at our, you know, our heart being desperately wicked. 1 Corinthians 8, 7 says, Their, consciences being, or their conscience being, seer, or being weak is defiled. 1 Timothy 4, 2, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Hebrews 10, 22, an evil conscience is mentioned. Titus 1.15, their mind and conscience is defiled. The people that live in the world today, sometimes you try to explain some stuff to them about the Bible, about things that are spiritual. Well, no, no, I don't understand that. I don't believe that. Or, you know, we look at the sin that takes place in the world, the things that are now completely legal to do, that we would even go back 50, 60, 100 years ago And people would, no way, there's no way that that would ever take place. Our conscience is seared like with a hot iron. You know, people who have suffered from, you know, first, second, third degree burns, they lose feeling. They become numb to it. You know, people who, we talked about drunkenness earlier, that are drowning in a sea of alcohol, they get to the point where they just have consumed so much That, oh man, well, you know, I just need to get this buzz on. It takes up such a substantial amount to do that for people who have just been consumed in it their whole lives. Because they have become numb to it. Are there things going on in the world that we used to blush about? 
that you're just like, oh, no, I'm just going to flake it off. I'm just going to, no, I'm not going to talk about it. When's the last person somebody was standing next to you and took the Lord's name in vain, your God's name in vain, and you said something about it? I've rarely heard somebody say something about it. It happens all the time. Does that not bother us? The God of the world, the God of the universe, he created us. He sent his only son to die on the cross. That's my God. And you're taking his name in vain. You're using his name as a swear word. Our conscience is defiled. It's been seared with a hot iron. And people continue to live that way. And it's just, it's, it's sad. It's very sad to see the conversations that take place in the world. Matthew 6, 20, 23 says, If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? This is yet another reason why we need the word of God in our hearts. You know, we are told to write God's word on our hearts We need to be memorizing as much of this as possible. Did you know that there might be a day coming where you might not get to hold a Bible in your hand? What if some things take place in the government? What if some things take place in our world and we no longer live in the, you know, oh, we live in the United States. It's never going to happen. You don't know that. How many stories have we heard of people who don't have Bibles in their own language I, you know, I remember hearing a story about a guy that was in jail that the only way that he could get the Bible is because he had to clean out this area of the prison. It was his job to clean it out. And one of the guards was using God's word as toilet paper. It is the only way that he had access to God's word. What if there is a day coming that you don't have access to God's word? We need to be writing it on our hearts. The Bible tells us our heart is desperately wicked. How do we combat that darkness? With light. God's word needs to become so important to us. We need to stop being consumed with all these other things of the world and start being consumed with God and start walking with him. You know, I said at the beginning, we're going to talk about spiritual light and truth. How's that conviction working out right now? I'm not really enjoying it so much. But God still uses it. And we need to come to that point where, okay, God, all right, I'm willing to give it over to you. I'm willing to listen to you. I'm willing to, you know, cover up that darkness with light. I'm willing to let you in. I'm willing to go and tell others about you so that they don't have to die and go to hell. We need to get to that point. So how are all these people in the world that are blinded How are they blinded from the truth? Well, God tells us. Satan has blinded people from the truth. 2 Corinthians 4, 3-4 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Or John 12, 40, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart and be converted. Satan has done such a great job of covering things up in the world or hiding things. You know, even look at Christians today, people who are born again Christians and they have no doubt they're on their way to heaven. Yet somehow God has, or the God of this world has said, you know what, I'm going to, I'm still going to try and blind them. I'm still going to try and steer them astray. I'm still going to try and pull them away from the things that are really the true things. Satan knows what churches are truly following God, and Satan knows what churches are just putting on a show. Oh, oh, that's, that's okay. You got saved, but you don't have to do anything for God. We'll just have you come over here into this church over here that, you know, they're just going through the motions. It's a big church. You'll enjoy it. It'll be okay. God, uh, the God of this world has blinded the eyes of man. Did you know that Jesus called Satan a liar? John chapter 8. Let's turn over there. John chapter 8 and verse 44. God's word tells us, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. 
he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. You know, we think uh, I've often heard the analogy given about, you know, the poison that is given to animals, rats. It's a big portion of things that are totally okay, but it's just that little bit of poison that's in there. It's that little bit of poison that Satan tries to insert in there that, you know, go back to our analogy about what church you're going to attend. Oh, it's okay. You're saved. This church, it, they have good music. Oh, well, a church ought to have good music. But what's his definition of good music? You know, we could go down so many different paths right now. Satan will take anything and twist it to meet his own agenda. He is full of lies. There is no truth in him. God's word says there is no truth in him. Yes, so many people believe him today. Well, no, Satan's not real. I don't really believe him. Well, you believe this, don't you? Well, yeah. Satan is the author of that. Satan is the one that is deceiving the world. Satan's preachers and ministers have blinded people from the truth. Let's go back to the health and wealth gospel. There's a lot of preachers that are in pulpits this morning that are deceiving the nations, that are leading them astray, whether it's in false cults, whether it's in uh, other spiritual organizations. Call it whatever you would like to call it, but there are pulpits that are being filled today that with people who are not speaking the truth, people who are not speaking the whole counsel of God. You know, we we think about years, you know, yesteryear and and the preachers that were in pulpits that were just, you know what, I'm going to preach the Bible the way it is, and God's going to work on people's hearts. And today we see churches that are, well, you know, this sounds good. This will probably bring in a good offering. I'm going to preach about this. That's sad to say. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen through 15 says, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness. Or Matthew fifteen fourteen that says, If the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. There's many people who are going to be in that Matthew chapter 7 category. Lord, Lord, have we not done this? You're blind, and you're leading them, and they're blind, and both of you are going to fall into a ditch. We see these leaders, these, these preachers, these big names of, of people that are tr- preaching at these, excuse me, at these mega churches that are just leading people astray. They're just doing it through a different avenue. You know, when we look at sin, God views sin all the same way. Well, think about all these people that are, oh, well, that, you know, at least they're going to church. They're being led astray in a church that's not following God's word. How is that any better than somebody who was out last night being led astray by alcohol in a bar? It's not. They're both sin. It's the same thing. The Bible speaks much about people being unknowingly deceived and deluded. Ephesians 4.18 says, Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their hearts, or John 1, 5. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. People don't know truth because they don't want to. People are willingly, willingly ignorant. People are spiritually ignorant because they don't want to see the light and they don't want to see the truth. You know, this is... This whole thing started out as just a, this is something that you can take. As somebody who you have had a chance to witness to, this is a a lesson plan that you can take them through to have an opportunity to witness to them and an opportunity to lead them to Christ. And I feel like every time I stand behind the pulpit, God's just like, are you doing this? There's a lot of Christians in the world that sit in pews, just like the ones we're sitting in today, that are you doing all of this? Are you listening to God's word? Are you being salt and light? Or are you just, well, I'm here on Sunday or I'm here on Wednesday and the rest of the week I just blend into the world? Sometimes that's a hard pill to swallow. Sometimes it's a difficult thing to look at. God sent his son to die for us. 
He sent his son to pay for my sin and yours. Why don't we put God in the place that he's supposed to be in our life? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, thank you so much for your word, Lord. Thank you that we have your truth. Lord, I pray that you would continue to speak to us today, continue to work on our hearts, Lord. I pray you'd be with pastors. He preaches in the next hour, Lord. And the visitors that will be here this morning, Lord, I pray that, that we would be a blessing to them, that we would be welcoming to them. And Lord, I pray that if there's anybody in this building today who doesn't know where they're going to spend their eternity, Lord, please work on their hearts. Please draw them unto you. Lord, we pray that we would, we would see a lost soul saved today. Lord, we thank you for it. We pray it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen.